think it's so liberating just being in a space where you feel as if you're seen and you feel like you're being heard. Business of Architecture UK, episode 53. Ryan Willard here, Business of Architecture UK, with a very special announcement. This Wednesday, I will be leading a webinar which will be looking at how three leaders of top UK architecture practices have broke the mold and grown their businesses from being bedroom practices or working in the spare room to international offices with landmark projects. Um, In this training, you will discover how These architects have gone from very humble beginnings, not knowing where work was going to come from, to building these internationally respected offices with these multi-million pound projects that in some cases define city skylines. Um, We're going to look at a number of different things. You're going to learn the three breakthrough secrets for building a dream practice how you can master your messaging to attract your ideal clients, and also how to define your niche to be able to win work. So make sure that you register to the webinar. I will provide the details in the information below. So go along, register that, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and a fantastically inspiring interview this week as I speak with BFA Black Females in Architecture, which comprises of and is co-founded by uh, Neba Ser, who is one of the co-founders of WU Architecture, W-H-U-H, a queer danso who is a part two at school. Scott Brownrigg, Selassie Setefer, who is the founder of Crystal Design Studio and who's recently just become a part three architect, um, and Alicia Marenke Fisher, who is one of the co-founders of 3.09. Now, these young ladies um, began the BFA network as a way to empower young black and black mixed heritage women in the fields of architecture, planning, construction, and urbanism. And what's really inspired me is the leadership of these young women and their entrepreneurial spirit. And in this interview, uh, the ladies talk about their experience in the industry and offer a notable perspective on important topics that are facing the architectural industry right today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy BFA. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. It's Ryan Willard here, your host, and I'm here with the BFA, which stands for Black Females in Architecture, and we have Neighbour Sir, got that right? We have Selassie Setefer. Yes. Alicia Marinka Fisher. Excellent. And Aquia Danso. Okay, excellent. I got that right. I'm I'm pleased. (laughs) And, and welcome, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. You guys are doing something which is very inspiring and been demonstrating a lot of leadership within the architectural industry and you're making a, you know, a powerful stand for a next generation of architects. So what is BFA? How did it begin? And give me a little bit of a background about your own, you know, where you are at in your own architectural careers because I know that Nobody's a qualified architect as yet. We've got Selassie who's just completing your part three. And you're all working independently, the mixture of freelancers, freelance work and working for practices. So great, we'll start with, with Neighbor. Yes, okay. Um, so I'm uh, one of the co-founders of BFA and my role here is a director. We have different roles. Um, and my background is in um, architecture. I graduated about two years ago uh, from St. Jose Martins and went on to create a small collective with two of my friends, um, kind of finding out how to work independently, doing competitions, the thing everyone kind of does, I guess. Um, so I also went on to become a young trustee of the Architecture Foundation and I organize um, events for them. One of them is called Part 4 and it's about getting um, established architects to answer questions to younger practitioners, which is really interesting because it has overlaps with what you do. Um, And overall I'm interested in how citizen-led initiatives can actually have an impact on the built environment um, on the long long run uh, in terms of planning and policy and therefore I've been working in um, 
basically in community development and community organizations and for the past two years. I'm not very traditional, I guess. And currently I'm working for Build Up Foundation as a young, young uh, youth construction leader. Um, basically, I'm helping young people to design and build um, construction projects in their own neighborhoods. Great. Yeah. Um, so, as you said, I'm currently doing my part three. Um, I graduated, I completed my part two um, at the MSA, Manchester School of Architecture, about two years ago as well. Um, shortly after, I set up uh, my own practice called Crystal Design Studios. Um, I think motivation behind that was one, because I kind of wanted to pursue something a little bit different find an alternative path through architecture but I also really wanted to focus my efforts on doing more people-centered um, architectural design um, yeah focusing on social uh, economic development and things like that um, so that's what I wanted to, my practice to be based on um, I then started consulting for a pra small practice called Elsie Owusu Architects uh, and have Elsie Owusu as a mentor of mine, and she's absolutely brilliant. Yep. <laughs> um, a, yeah, big powerhouse. Um, and then I became a trustee of the RIBA um, and also um, vice president for students and associates, which still currently in my position till the end of September, I believe. Um, and yeah, I've been doing, it's been interesting because they don't have that many young people as part of the trusteeship in RIBA. So we've been trying to change things up and like, you know, ruffle some feathers in a positive way, yep. which seems to be going well. So we're in the midst of trying to push an agenda for a program called Future Architects Network um, to just try and bring together the kind of divergent bits of you know part one's not really connected with anybody or anything part twos aren't really connected with anybody or anything graduates and maybe up to five years post part three are not really engaged in much so we want to kind of create a network to bring those kind um, groups together um yeah i think that's me <laughs> alicia um so in BFA, I am the social media manager, uh, which is very, it's a, it's a challenge in itself because I have no background in it. Um, but at the same time, I'm learning so many different new skills. Um, I'm also uh, really interested in landscape architecture um, and environmental architecture and kind of questioning how climate change, um, kind of how climate change is confronted in the architectural paradigm. Um, and then I'm really interested in um, urban planning as well. So I'm trying to kind of see, I'm trying to see how I exist in those kind of s scopes. Um, I started a collective back in 2017 with my co-founder Hani. And um, we're a team of like nine people, uh, young people. Um, and we're all about creating social change. So we are very much tech based. We're very kind of like entrepreneurial focused. But at the same time, we realized that something that was missing was the migrate experience. What it means to um, infuse culture, what it means to kind of infuse geography um, as part of like the entire landscape. Um, but then at the same time, really question our position as young people in the built environment. And I think I'm really passionate about making sure that we talk about the built environment as a whole as well, not just necessarily architecture, but providing that access. And so that led me to also start Young Architects Network um, out of frustration um, after I finished my BA honours. And that was primarily because I kept seeing that um, a lot of established architects were just not accessible. There wasn't that mentorship. So I was just like, okay, why don't we just see ourselves as mentors? Um, so that now is growing and it's a group of, it's self-sustaining. So it's a network on Facebook and we have over 200 members. It's very international. So everyone comes in with their own kind of like um, opinions. They come in with their um, questions. And I think it's really nice just to have that space where we feel kind of comfortable enough to kind of um, immerse ourselves in uh, really questioning the profession, but also ourselves. Um, and yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm basically the baby of the group, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to understand kind of where architecture is um, and where I exist as well. Amazing. 
Yeah, so um, I'm the accounts manager for BFA and um, like Kalisha, I don't have any background um, within what I'm doing in terms of uh, looking for funding and managing our current uh, income that we, we earn from our you know, uh, events. Um, I work full time, so um, at Scott Brownwig Architects, um, the head office in Covent Garden, and I've been there for almost coming up to three years this summer. And um, previous to that, I was at uh, University of Liverpool for my part two degree. And um, whilst I was there, I um, got a bursary from the Stephen Lawrence um, Trust to help fund my part two and I was able to do an Erasmus semester in um, the Sao in Germany and that was really great and to uh, study and um, abroad mm. and come back and I learned lots of new things and made new friends um, and so at my work now um, I work in, within the delivery team um, so the separate sub-company of Scott Brownwig, which is the design delivery unit, and we just take on projects from other architects and we deliver them, so actually build them, um, make the project happen. So um, I work mainly in stage four, stage five, RBA stages, um, just creating drawing packages. So I've moved away from um, the planning stage of projects where I was doing uh, residential and commercial within my practice um, and yeah uh, yeah I don't really have any any design collectives or anything outside of what I do but um, so yeah. how how did BFA come into existence what's the what's Ooh. the origin of it who's responsible are you all responsible <laughs> I think um, never mentioned the her part four um, events that the AF um, run every couple of months and it was at that event that we all met like by by chance and what and what was the conversation when you guys first met um well the by chance I don't know it was a little bit of by chance but a little bit of coordinated effort because I had met Neba a couple of months before I had, and then I think I read that you were a trustee of the AF, and I was like, oh my gosh, who is this girl? <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so uh, yeah, I went, to, uh, I went to an architecture foundation event, I think it was called Turncoats or something, a crazy event, and we spoke that day, and we swapped numbers, and we kept in touch, and then I met Alicia at the RIBA. We won tickets to go to an event, which was like an, in I can't, yeah, some, some, some event. So we met there and we got to talking there. Um, and then she came to, so there was an event, part four event, like months later. I went and she went, so they were two familiar faces. So after the event, we went to speak to each other. And then out of the corner of our eye, we clocked <laughs> Ekria and we were like, oh my gosh, another black female. <laughs> and we accosted her because we could see her looking shifty and looking like she wanted to run away. So we went and like, yeah, accosted her and was like, introduced ourselves and all swapped numbers and said, oh yeah, we're going to stay in, in touch. And I think Alicia was the, the admin for our WhatsApp group and she named it Black Females in Architecture, I think. Or yeah, something like that, something like that. And then fast forward, so yeah, I think maybe a month later or so, I remember I was like, oh, I've got some friends, a couple of friends from uni who are also black females who I'd love to include in the group. Let, let's all keep in touch. I added my friends, I think you added some friends, you added some friends, you added some friends, they all added some friends. Like two, three months down the line, we had like 60 people in the group. So this, is, like, this is all on the WhatsApp group? Yeah. Okay, great. So two, three months down the line, we have like 60 people and we're like, okay, we need to make another group. So, <laughs> so the four of us exit, well, we still in the group, but we make another group and we now become like, yeah, the executives of the group and start having conversations about, okay, what is this that we're doing or what, what, it, what could it become? And yeah... That's that's the story behind that's the and, genesis. And, and and what has it become? What is it? What is the mission of BFA? Why why has it been in? Why did you feel such a natural pull towards 
each other and like what is the shared experience what? yes i think um bfa was born out of a need to have a space to speak to each other to um have shared experiences and to share knowledge and to mentor each other and to really be there for each other because it can feel quite lonely at architecture industry events which we notice when we when we bumped into each other and we were surprised, <laughs> which is quite sad if you think about it. Um, so I think the, the WhatsApp group was born out of the need to stay in touch with each other, but then we realized um, because of the growing of it at such a fast rate um, that a lot of other girls had the same feeling and things that were shared in the group were really valuable. And this made us think about what, what this group could be like really um, made our imagination run really wild at mm. <laughs> very early. I think the potential for this group was pretty clear in the first few months where we were thinking about offering each other mentorships in a more formal way, connecting to black females in the industry who've done really great things and um, just looking at this as an opportunity to learn more, to become better and to actually go for those leadership positions and to go for management positions and to mentor students that are actually struggle, struggling in the industry and uh, sorry, in the edu education, in the education um, institutional environment. So I think now BFA really um, is that support network that we were thinking about become uh, that we were thinking that it could become at the very beginning. Um, and we now organize regular social events, um, meetups, um, workshops as well, and um, really place to provide each other with mentorship, knowledge, um, support, and yeah, to to potentially then also create projects that we could and, run together. And, and what are the themes, what are the issues that, that you find yourself most commonly dealing with and speaking about? And the, what are the ones that, the most, that you think are the most important that the industry needs to be looking at? I would just say visibility <laughs> as one. Okay, okay, no. Mm -hmm. no. okay. <laughs> um, I think the common thing that um, we kind of realized was that we were all probably the only black or mixed race female within our courses, or maybe even in the entire school, maybe a handful, um, and in your offices, even big and small. And architecture, especially if you are striving to become an architect, it's a long journey, and it can be a lonely one if you're there and there's no one is that you can fully relate to. Um, and I'll just be blunt. There's a lot of discrimination, especially when it comes to going for job opportunities or even within university when you're studying, th there are times when maybe your tutors will be slightly um, biased towards other students. And I've spoken to a few people, even males and black males, and they've also experienced the same thing during their university studies. So these are topics and issues that we, you can't necessarily speak to mm. just anyone and so we found even with just the four of us when we first met at the part four we briefly touched on this and we're like wow I had the same experience particularly I remember talking about this with you Selassie and um, we just felt there's a need we need that space we want to be comfortable to discuss these things and how we can support each other on our journeys yeah um. I think I just wanted to add to your question about our mission. I think, um, so what Selassie said earlier, I think it's about visibility of black and black mixed women in the built environment and their achievements and shine a light on uh, women in the industry who've done really great things because they are, they are there. <laughs> it's just that it's not visible. They're not mm. visible. Their achievements aren't visible. Um, and also open up opportunities for um, um, black women and mixed women who are currently studying in the future, in the workplace, um, to go for leadership positions positions and management positions and become those leaders for the ones who come later and then ultimately also collaborate together and run projects and um, you know go into the design and creative and architecture world and deliver yeah and that's the best way to actually prove that you can do what you say you can do mm. <laughs> I think also like um, role models are really important so I I can imagine well I think we all know that, especially within our network, there weren't that many people that a lot of us could look up to, especially within the education system, if it's even in academia. So um, just having a tutor who was a black female was really imperative because at the end of the day, 
um, especially when you're from different cultures um, and then you kind of want to bring that into the, the architectural kind of um, historic landscape. Um, or at least even in your projects, that's how kind of like you want to communicate um, how your new kind of innovations could be. I think it could be easily, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it could easily just be very, it's a very isolating space to be in when you kind of are trying to express your culture, express kind of like maybe even if it's your religion and people are not really getting it. So I think just having someone whether it's from your religion side or from your cultural background or kind of just be able to kind of say, okay, this is actually something that we could dive into, even given that an option to look at, I think that's really imperative just moving forward. So. And, 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 and why, do you, why do you think there is like an institutional kind of non-acknowledgement of this? I think, Especially within architecture, I think it's because of the length. And the reason I say that is mainly because if the dropout rate is so high um, before people even get to part three. So could you give us a, a, some, I know you had some figures Oh yeah, earlier, so, so. so for black um, students to reach part three, um, the, the dropout rate is, oh no, it's the next slide. Yeah, so less than 2% um, where black students who reached part three level and success successfully passed, starting from a proportion of 7% at part one. So already that shows the, the, the scale of what we're working with. But then at the same time, it shows that, for instance, if especially when it comes to academia, obviously you have to have like a master's or something. So if those people are not even getting to that part, then it's really, it'll be so difficult to even find that representation, to find that kind of um, space for them to exist and to feel empowered about kind of even minute stuff as, as like crits and, and presentations. Um. <laughs> what, 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 what are the, what do you think are the most common obstacles that BAMME students are facing at the moment that causes these kinds of very concerning statistics? Um, I think part of it is, like Alicia was saying, just the sheer length of the course. Um, because a lot of BMA, BAME students would be coming from working class, middle class backgrounds. Not all, but quite a significant amount. Mm. Um, and if you're coming from that kind of a background, there is um, an expectation you often would probably be expected as the person who's going to go and get and achieve a higher education to be the person to come back and support the family. If the, tr the length of the course is so long, when are you possibly going to be able to come back and do that? And if the sort of um, return on the investment isn't there of you know how much is costing to maintain you and support you throughout your education as well as your tuition fee as well as the fact that you're not getting paid during that time and then you're not going to come out with a guaranteed job and even if you did get a job the job is going to be paying you way less than say if you did another type of course it, it just doesn't become viable financially anyway and then that whole thing of whether you're passionate about it or not if you at the end of the day if you're in a position where you need your bread and butter assured. And if it can't do that, then it's just not an option. It becomes sort of a luxury, really. Um, yeah. yeah. Just to add on that, um, I think it's also to massively also to do with the job opportunities. As I said, like there's this, the discrimination that happens when you apply for a job. But also, um, I think, as Alicia's saying, there aren't many of us out there within the field who are already doing these things in um, managerial sort of levels. So if you're a student, you may not have that many contacts, particularly in large offices, everyone, you're kind of biased to give someone a chance who comes from a similar background as yourself. So if there aren't many of us out there to begin with, who's going to help us even, you know, yeah, just give us that interview, you know? Um, I think a lot of us came from backgrounds or families where we are the first, you know, people to go into architecture or construction as a career choice. So from the start, 
y- you're on your own and you've really got to ch- fight hard to try and get contacts or people ch- out there to generally push you forward. And so um, in terms of dropout rate, I reckon it's a lot of people get disheartened. A lot of mm. women can get disheartened, especially coming out of your part one, your part two, and trying to get a placement. And it's just easier to get jobs in other other fields, I think. So. Also, I just, to, I just want to add as well as what you're saying. Um, I think it's important in the sense of within the UK, distance is really important yeah is really integral because if you're living let's say in north of England and you're going to university there or you're going to somewhere that's doesn't have like a high in, in, in a high impact of not impact but a high um influx of black students then again you're by yourself but at the same time I think there's a struggle of most of the events are happening in London most of like most of the networking, um, maybe even cool savvy events, or maybe something that could easily like help your dissertation is probably in London. So it's like really building that awareness of how can we allow for other people to have that access. But then at the same time, I think there needs to be more of a flexibility to the, ed- the educational course as well. So if you're the only breadwinner in your family, um, there should be a space of okay. For instance, if you're caring for someone, um, there should be a space where there's there's flexibility in your course um, so that it could be more um, accommodating for you. But mm-hmm. then financially, because we're starting off at nine grand, that's, that's, that's so much for someone to kind of take into um, account. And I don't think we really take that into account until we get a job and when we see it off of our pay slips. So, <laughs> which is very, yeah. <laughs> But at the same time, it's just going back to kind of like that flexible working, um, uh, flexible working uh, reality, but then also thinking about location and access and, um, yeah, representation and support. You know, I just want to add to that. I think um, the list goes on, really. Okay. <laughs> the list goes so, on. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested as well to know some of your experiences of discrimination like where where does it happen where does it happen in in universities where is it happening in at at work and what is it like when you try and talk about discrimination because sometimes it can be people will be like what are you talking about or like what what you know what is that like what's that been like for you guys I think a very um, simple example is if you are one of two uh, black women at an event or even in architecture, when your tutor continuously mistaken you for the other black girl. <laughs> and it's, it's not just for me. I think a lot of girls can say this example and we, we laugh about it, but it is a reality. So I think it's a simple thing of knowing who you're speaking to, distinguishing your students, because there are two different people. <laughs> I think that's a very common thing. and. Um, I guess it, it it gets laughed off if you tell your tutor about it. It's a thing that is, oh, I have so many students, but it's not really that. So I think that's 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 a very simple example. I just think it's very easy to be your efforts in what you do to be kind of ignored, you know, and um, somebody else could uh, be picked over you and if there were redundancies, you know, within your office and um, that person may have even um, joined a practice after you did and you feel you've worked hard and done a good job but they were picked but again, they are more of a likeness to the general demographic of the office so mm. maybe they fitted in better and so there's there's lots of I think fitting in, basically, with your environment is probably the thing here. Um, but yes, never I've experienced that. <laughs> it's really embarrassing to the point where I can't. I'm even too scared to even correct the person. Like, no, I'm not so and so. I'm a queer. But I mean, you yeah. just yeah, just take it. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 what's the power of like being a group to be able to share these types of experiences and what's and what do you see that where do you where are you going with the bfa what's next oh man well i think the first quickly if you answer your first one i think it's very um what's that word cathartic 
mm. to for us to actually get this off our chests and you know um release the burdens that we have carried for you know a certain number of years and um just comfort each other you know build each other up support each other encourage each other to not give up especially if you know somebody or a couple of members have generally started to wonder whether they want to stay in this career and obviously it's up to them at the end of the day but what the, be the best thing we can do is be there to listen and offer advice and even different alternatives um, to that member i think it's so liberating just being in a space where you feel as if you're seen and you feel like you're being heard. And I think what BFA at least is trying to do is provide that space, that entity, that community that is always gonna be kind of like there at like a WhatsApp text. And I think that's, that's to me, I've never really come across that before. And it's really nice to have all different types of women from all different types of spaces, just to kind of have their input and to suggest new job opportunities or suggest maybe um, new alternatives to um, themes or to even just do simple things as like fill in a survey for someone's dissertation. Um, so I think it's just very liberating to have a group where you can just feel as if, okay, I'm actually existing and I'm existing to thrive rather than just existing to be like, okay, I'm just surviving and um, I don't know, I can't really express how I feel in, in, in certain areas um, so I think this gives at least a platform for us to really think about where we want to be in the future but also how we can help each other and build that kind of system of mentorship um, I think yeah it's really liber liberating and it's in itself so empowering um, I think for me my experience, I don't know, I think I've, I spent a lot of time not even, the penny didn't really drop. It became so, stuff just becomes so normal that it, it doesn't really click as to how discriminatory things are around you. Everyone else has got a job. Why haven't you got a job? Mm. Let's see our portfolios. Let's compare them. Mm. Eh, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> but it, the penny doesn't really drop. I'm just this wallowing in self-pity and doubt and I'm not good enough but actually nah, that's not really it there's something else to miss here and it's only when you get around other people who've gone through similar experience that you realize that actually no this isn't acceptable let's do something about it no one clearly nobody wants to do something about it for us or on our behalf let's do something about it let's band together let's you know um create I don't know, what is it? It's power in numbers, isn't it? Yeah. And our voices are louder together than alone. So let's do that, let's band together. Let's, you know, create our own opportunities if that's what needs to happen. Yeah, just adding to creating our own opportunities. I think one of the things that we still have to explore and that we're really excited about is actually there's so much talent and so much um, skill in this group. Like there's so many different ages, people from different countries. So the potential of creating something together to actually design together, be, be designers, be creatives, um, produce something together is so exciting. I think that's something that we're really looking forward to do in the future and that's... Yeah, it's just um, incredible to think about a BFA project and that's definitely where we want to go as well as providing help and um, support for each other to actually work together mm. and to deliver. And, and, and what do you think about the, the potential of, you know, the kind of new wave of entrepreneurship and business and how there's a lot more... It's an interesting conversation what you were saying about how there is such an importance to get registered and to get the title... And then there, it's kind of also alongside of that now we don't necessarily need to get registered in many, many aspects because there are other entrepreneurial ventures that we can, we can do. What are, your, what are your thoughts on, on that? <laughs> I think particularly when we first started, we had quite a few discussions around this. And my view is one that is kind of... It's a, it's a bit unfortunate, but I feel like to be able to command that leadership and respect position as a black female in this industry, I think I'll be doing myself a disservice if I didn't get the title. Everybody else can be fine and progress and do all sorts of things without the title, but I will be doing myself a great 
disservice by not getting that title because I already don't gain get the respect or that I feel like I deserve anyhow. So, you know, I think, yeah, I will be doing myself a disservice if I wanted to really be in the architectural space and design and execute architectural built projects then yeah i'll be doing myself a disservice without getting a title although i love the the current trend of entrepreneurship entrepreneurship um and i've considered myself an entrepreneur um so i don't know with or without the title i think i'll be okay but i still feel like because i want to be involved in the built environment not just in sort of, there's all sorts of things though now, isn't there? There's space, there's place making, there's all sorts of things that don't necessarily involve, you know, building architecture. And that's a part of what I want to do as well, which doesn't obviously require the title, but for the particular part that I want to fulfill in terms of building architecture, designing architecture, I feel I do need the title just because I'm a black female. And I find it really interesting because I think this is where I'm a bit different because I feel like for me, I'm, I don't see kind of going into part two. I don't see going into part three. And I think this is only just based off of kind of like all of the findings I've <laughs> had from the BFA <laughs> network. Um, and You're I like, nah. honestly, <laughs> yeah, wrong. the dirt is. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, it's given me a really big awakening to like ask myself, do I want to get myself into a financial, uh, financial deficit? Do I want to be kind of, I think I've, I've, it's been a challenge because I'm still trying to figure out what it is I want to do. But I think now I'm more adamant. And I think before, if you had asked me, oh, Alicia, would you want to do part two? I would have been like, yeah, I would have gone through the straight, narrow kind of road. But now it's like, I'm literally a part one arc set. Um, oh, architecture designer, sorry. <laughs> 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 and and I, I see the value in it. I see the value in being an architectural designer and also being an entrepreneur and being a multifaceted designer. And I think this is where kind of like the 3.9 side of the design collector comes in because I, I am able to really express my architectural narrative in that discipline or in that um, area. And with kind of like other people who are like-minded as well. Some of them want to be accredited architects. Some of us just want to be like engineering and planning and curatorial design. But that scope of them even questioning kind of where they want to be allows me to be like, oh, okay, actually I don't need to take that route. Maybe I should go into, um, I don't know, tech. Maybe I should go into um, environmental sciences. So I think at the moment I'm in a weird space where I'm just like, how can tech and architecture merge together? And then at the same time, look at AI and all these type of stuff. And if you've asked me again, like last year, Alicia, what are you doing? Like, why are you going into like tech and all this type of stuff? And I wouldn't. I would have frozen up. I wouldn't have said anything. But now I see so much opportunity for architect designers or people, even in in the undergraduate kind of. Um, state to kind of go into like filmmaking or to go into and I think that is for me personally that is architecture and maybe this will ruffle some feathers but I think that is what an architect is I think we are architects all of us and I get that in the UK it's very constrained and it's, it's titled and I understand the laws that come with it as well so I get it but I still believe that we can be architects but in different forms <laughs> I have some big, big <laughs> issues with it. Like, like opinions. I look at Alicia and I think she's in a brilliant position in terms of not knowing what she wants to do, but has an idea of the areas of her interest, especially just stopping at part one. It's only like in my journey is very similar to Celeste. We both started architecture in 2009, so that's 10 years ago. And it's only now, I think as of this year, oh, well, the three of us um, as part three students started 10 years ago. And I think that's the average um, number of years, 10 years in the UK it takes to qualify. It's only now for me this year that I'm more educated in terms of what else is out there, mm. in terms of you don't have to have the title, you can go into other things. And... Um, if I could turn back time, if you, you know, met me in 2014, like five years ago, you know, I, that would have probably been the key moment where I could have just taken another step back and actually explored 
what are the other what else could I delve into because for me now I'll be honest similar to Alicia I don't know exactly what I want to do I'm all, I'm studying for my part three I hope I will qualify but I'm no longer sure whether I actually just want to practice as an architect and I think it's it's a shame for me that it's taken me this long and within enrolling on my part three course that I've had this realization but not to become a statistic like what we see up there I'm going to try um, and get that title, mm. which is how Selassie feels it's important to have it, and Nebo as well for what she wants to do with um, her collective. It's important the three of us have that title as a, I don't know, um, yeah, just that extra <laughs> bit that people can take us seriously, even if we don't necessarily end up just, you know, working in the office nine to five as an architect. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think I want to be doing that either. But um, we've come this far, so we feel we we need to get that that title. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say as well, I think we're very entrepreneurial. Like we've started a network, and we've grown so quickly in the past what eight months, eight months. And I think also some of us have collective practices. Like I think we've already kind of. Um, I get we, we want the respect, we need the respect, but I also think we are creating and we keep co-creating different things. So I think just being able to be in a space where we have the opportunity to be around like-minded people, to think of new ideas, think of new projects, think of new software stuff, I don't know. But it gives me so much like joy. I think, because I never was able to see that. I'd never had anyone in my, in personally in my architectural course to be like, oh yeah, let's create a network. <laughs> um, let's create a product or let's create a service. Let's, let's look at the like different scopes of how architecture can exist and merge. And then also think about the current state of architecture because no one was really questioning in my course the current state of architecture at that time. So. Great, thank you. Thank, that's, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, What's what's next for BFA and what's like if people want to get involved, people who are listening to this around the world and what's the best way for them to get in, in contact with you and what kind of opportunities are there to, you know, how are you growing your the network, how are you growing the movement? Okay. Um, you can definitely follow us on Instagram. Okay, it's Insta popping. <laughs> it is um, Black Femme Arc. Um, so it's basically, if it's there. Yeah, yeah so at uh, Black F E M A R C. Um, and then we have Twitter. We're very, very good. Well, I feel like we're quite good at Twitter personally. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then also on our website, which is www.blackfemarcs.com as well. Um, and LinkedIn as well. I think for me personally, like I've really liked LinkedIn for the past few months. I'm starting to use it. Be proud of me. I'm <laughs> I never realized how great it was until like recently. And I was like, oh it's my God. It's a hidden weapon. Yeah. It's a hidden weapon. Um, yeah, we essentially want to be, a, not want to be, we are starting to be a global network. So more members are more than welcome. Obviously, there's a caveat. You have to be a black female. <laughs> <laughs> black, black, or black Fair enough. mixed but female. <laughs> I mean, we take all supporters. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> the name's in the title. <laughs> look, look, look. Um, just to add to that, obviously, um, having new members um, would be amazing. And um, we are in architecture, so it doesn't you don't need to be an architect. You don't need to be an aspiring architect. Anything you do within the built environment, design, creativity, um, you know, come join us. We have so many different people that are in management and property, um, all kinds of different fields. And I think that's the beauty of it, learning from different kind of dif disciplines and um, just opening up this conversation about architecture. Amazing. Um, we would also really like to have maybe more localized groups. So, like, kind of echoing what Alicia was saying earlier about um, the lack of like regional representation. As in the UK, as an example, I always went to school outside. I'm from London, East London, but I always went to school. I went to Portsmouth, and then I went to Manchester, and obviously the diversity there is a bit different so having local groups and people who are excited about what we're doing and wanting to sort of set up sort of local hubs would be great both in the UK and all over wherever that would be great brilliant 
And um, a future for BFA, I think um, with the trend of diversity in the media and everywhere in the workplace, um, I think it will be, it's really important that our uh, mission of making black women visible in the industry actually happens. So we would welcome support from larger practices, smaller practices, recruitment agencies. Like as never said, like we have a lot of talent within our network, women doing all sorts of different things. Um, and it would be great if we could work together with um, such partners to get you know, more um, women, especially the younger ones, fresh out of uni or school, to get into um, practices, gain experience. Um, like, a lot of, they need to actually start doing. So if you want to increase diversity in your workplace, really do look properly. We are out there and mm. we can do, um, we have the same skills as everyone else. You know, we've gone through the same education system. So um, I personally want to see these um, companies and recruitment agencies start approaching us, um, yeah. And I also think as well that we, as much as we exist inclus like um, to support our BFAs, we also, I think, are really supportive of diverse groups as well. Mm -hmm. So seeing, I think there's an Asian um, architects group kind of like emerging slowly, but we've heard of things like that. So I think being able to see that, okay, obviously it's not just us, but it's other people at the forefront as well who should be recognized. I think we're just kind of like the catalyst for that. So I think it'd be great to kind of see more of these networks come together and more people feel like they can, feel like they have a space to express themselves. So yeah, I definitely think if you're, especially if you're young and you're listening to this, I think it'd be great if, if you kind of feel kind of isolated in one space or another, definitely get in contact with us because I feel like we have kind of also bridged borders with other people who might not necessarily fit our um, network, but are really engaged and want to bridge their own, so. Amazing, thank you so much for your time this evening. I really enjoyed our conversation. So that is a wrap, thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.